This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Harvey Crane. And my name is Sonny Agarwal. And so, uh, you know, just uh, starting off quickly with some announcements. Uh, Epicenter is going to be holding a meetup uh, next week in Paris, uh, right, coinciding with ECC. And myself and Sebastian will both be there. And it'll be a cool meetup. You can come meet, uh, you know, the hosts, uh, some other uh, past guests that we've had, as well as, you know, other listeners. And it should be a good time. And also at ETC, I'll go ahead, I'll be going and giving a workshop on the Cosmos SDK. And so it's a two hour uh, hands on workshop. So if you're interested in getting started with developing on using that, um, come check that out. Cool. Yeah, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it this year, but I was here, I think, two years ago and it was lots of fun. So I, um, I'm envious of, uh, of the meetup and hopefully next time I'll be part of it too. It's definitely my favorite uh, Ethereum conference I've been to. So today we're going to speak with Amory Seche. He's the lead developer of, of Bitcoin ABC. We're going to speak about Bitcoin Cash, something we haven't covered before. Now, we felt there was so much to talk about here that we ended up splitting it up into two episodes. So uh, that's just a heads up. So this is going to be part one that we listened to today. We spoke a lot about, you know, kind of his early getting into Bitcoin, uh, the block size debate and the whole scalability debates that happened years ago, but they were really kind of the genesis to Bitcoin Cash and a lot that came afterwards. We spoke about Segwit2x. So there's a little bit of a history tour as well. And I think it's, uh, and maybe some newer listeners, they don't remember those times, but they were, you know, there were a lot of heated debates about this topic uh, years ago. And we did countless episodes on this topic. So if you're interested, and it was definitely a very, very interesting time. Uh, that, of course, Bitcoin Cash arose out of. And then we also spoke uh, a bit about uh, some of the different technical views around uh, scaling, around hard forks, around, uh, you know, transaction ordering. And yeah, it was, uh, I thought it was a great conversation. Yep. So with that, let's go to the interview with Amory. So we're here with Amory Seche. Amory is uh, the lead developer of Bitcoin ABC, and he's been working on Bitcoin Cash for a long time. Of course, Bitcoin Cash is something that uh, we've never really talked about on this podcast, even though it's been around for 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 quite some time. And at some point, you know, it took up so much mind space uh, in the in the cryptocurrency world, but still there's a lot of interesting things going on with, in Bitcoin Cash. So we're really looking forward to diving into both the history uh, as well as, you know, the technological differentiation that uh, has come up in Bitcoin Cash. So yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Amory. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I, I remember we spoke uh, about a year ago for a while. And one of the things I remember that you, you talk quite a bit about how you got into Bitcoin originally, which was like very early on. Do you mind sharing that kind of your early uh, exploration of Bitcoin? Yes. Um, well, first I was very interested in uh, like digital currency even before it existed. This was, uh, you know, something that was interesting to me. And I discovered Bitcoin in late 2010, I think it was November or December. Um, and so that was kind of like the first instantiation of that ID that was actually working. There was, you know, previous attempt, but they all were flowed in some way. So I was very interested and started following what's going on. And then after, uh, say more like in 2012 or so, it started growing very big. So I was like, okay, this is not just me that is seeing something there that is interesting, but. Actually, it seems that there are a lot of people in the world that start to catching up with that idea. So, um, yeah, you know, in, in 2012 or on that, I was, uh, you know, this is where I had the realization that it would become very, very big. And so at the time, did you, um, were you just kind of watching it afar or did you start maybe working on some little things or exploring different aspects of the code or like what, what, in what way did you engage with Bitcoin back then? 
Oh, so I was more interested by the economic uh, aspect of it to begin with. Uh, so I didn't look in the code right away. Uh, I looked in the code more recently uh, when, you know, because in the early days, it seems that there was a team of developers that were, you know, doing just fine. So it, it's not like there was much of a need for me to get involved in the code. Um, but say so I probably started to look in the code in, in 2015, maybe or so. I see. And so, you know, instead of jumping in full time, I know when we were discussing, uh, you mentioned you were spending, you had, you spent a lot of time at, uh, Facebook along, uh, during that time from like, you know, 2010, 20 up till like, you know, 2015 or so. Uh, and so, you know, was like, what was Facebook at all like in interested in like what was going on or was this like sort of something that, that was just on your side interest and like, also, how did your time at Facebook like help, you know, you know, maybe impact the way you look at blockchain development and whatnot? Okay, so so the, the main problem for a company like Facebook is that right now there are um, uh, many open questions when it comes to scaling blockchains. And so if a company like Facebook were to say, okay, you know, like Facebook, for instance, has a payment system within their messaging app, right? If they were to say, okay, we enable Bitcoin, in Messenger, like next week, it would be a giant disaster, right? Because there would be so much people using it at, at some point, um, and, and you know the network just couldn't handle it. So some some engineer at Facebook were interested by Bitcoin, and and even some engineer I know at the time wrote some code to support it, but um, it, it was not scalable enough uh, for it to make a lot of sense for Facebook, you know, to, to adopt that. And um, so, so that was a bit of the situation that was at Facebook, though my experience at Facebook, I think, was useful in many ways because um, so first I worked on. I worked in, in the growth department of Facebook. So what is growth at Facebook? It's um, uh, people building technology um to improve facebook so that more people use it essentially to you know simplify a lot and um, that gave me a lot of insight about how to make a product that people want to use and how to grow that um from you know from a technical standpoint but not only and and <laughs> and um yeah yeah, so that was useful to bring that in crypto. I think it gave me a different mindset that most people may have in the space. And so recently, there's been uh, lots of you know some news that Facebook is starting to have a serious blockchain effort, and they're actually hiring some teams, and supposedly there's like you know substantial effort in there. What's now that you have some distance, you don't work at Facebook anymore, you can uh, freely share your opinion. What do you think? Uh, what's your expectation of what Facebook will end up doing with blockchain? Um, I, I don't have any particular insight because as you mentioned, I'm not working for Facebook anymore. Uh, what I would expect from that is maybe something that is very ripple like to settle payments, uh, because Facebook has a lot of international uh, payment system in there. And right now they rely on third party to settle like, like PayPal and Venmo and, and this kind of people. So if they can develop something that is similar to Ripple, it could help their system quite a bit. And I think this is, um, I think this is what they are doing, but I don't, I don't know any better than anyone else. So that's more of a internal enterprise product than, than a consumer facing thing. I, I would expect it. Yeah, I would expect it. Because, you know, Facebook doesn't have very much this culture of, um, you know, let's build an alternative currency to subvert the system or whatever. This is not um, this is not something that is built in the DNA of a company like Facebook. So I would be very surprised if this is what they were doing. Yeah, absolutely. So then you, you mentioned 2015, you started getting seriously involved in uh, in the Bitcoin space. And I guess that's also sort of when the blockchain or the debate around the block size was really, uh, you know, heating up. And of course, on this podcast, we did countless episodes on it. So how, what, what triggered this involvement back then? And how do you remember the block size debate? Okay, so 
Yeah, it's very interesting because one of the one of the question I had I actually had a, a small intervention in the community in like 2012 or something like that. So, OK, for people to know, I was there very early on, but for the most time I was, you know, uh, keeping a very low profile. And the reason is, um, I mean, I, I think most people in the space can understand this is like a very subversive technology. And so um, it's not always the best idea to, you know, attach your name to it early on. And I think this is why people like Satoshi, you know, choose to stay anonymous. And I was kind of in the same mindset. But um, I still had some interaction with the community in 2012 around the block size, because that was kind of like my last question. At that time, I saw the technology is there, it's working, it has the potential to be big, but there is this block size stuff. And... And it was very clear to me at the time that if the block size stuff stay, then um, eventually we're gonna run to the limit, and um, and so you know it's gonna prevent the growth of of the system. So I went in there, I asked uh, people, but at the time people, um, almost everybody was like, yeah, no problem, you know, like when we get anywhere close to the actual limit, we're gonna raise it and everything. So I was like, okay, so. This seems to be moving in the right direction, so I should, you know, uh, I should consider this to be something very serious. And then what happened is that the people that are more on the side where the block size limit should stay small, uh, starting having more and more influence in, into the community. I think the people that were for raising the block size made a, a lot of strategic mistake along the way that allowed those people to, to gain a lot of influence. And so it resulted in the situation where at some point those people were more influential and more numerous than the one that wanted to increase the block size. And this is where this whole thing started to, um, you know, turn into a war of some kind. What are some of these, uh, you know, strategic mistakes that like some of these big block opponents made? Would one of them be backing uh, Craig Wright's claim to being Satoshi, perhaps? Uh, yeah, but that was fairly late. Um, I think even before that, there were, there were uh, various mistakes. So what you see in most open source projects, so there is another project I participate in a lot that is called LLVM. It's a, a compiler infrastructure project. So it's for people who don't know, it's a software that takes source code that is written by developer in a way that human being can understand and turn it into binary that a chip can execute. And this project is, um, you know, as participant from many big company in, in you know, the computer science space. Um, so you have company like uh, Google and Facebook and Amazon and this kind of people, they are going to contribute. Why do they contribute? Because um, they have millions of server, literally, right? And if you have one million server, you improve the performance of application by 1%, it's 10,000 server that you don't need anymore that you can use to do something else. So it, it, uh, when you have like millions of machines, it really quickly add up to very substantial amount of money. So they are participating for those reasons. You have people from Intel or AMD or ARM or, you know, chip manufacturer. And why? Because they want to make sure that the code generated for their chip is, um, you know, very high quality. They also want to ensure that Maybe the engineers that work for Intel, they care a lot about the performance of uh, uh, the code generated for Intel, but they don't care that much about the performance on AMD chips, right? So if you let the Intel engineer do all the work and you are AMD, this is probably a strategic mistake because, you know, your, your processor are going to end up being worse for your customer. Uh, because the software support around it for compiler is not as good. And I think the big blocker made that mistake. So the, the people that were more for small block invested very heavily in infrastructure, right? Like company like, like Blockstream, for instance, hired a lot of developer of the core software client. And the other company, not as much. And as a result, you have, um, you have this effect where if you depend on some infrastructure, but you are not really invested in it, then the people that are actually, like, you know, you are at the mercy of, of the people building it. And so I think that was a bit of a strategic mistake. So right, and so like, probably you know, the first one and the biggest one. So the small blocker narrative has been kind of like you know in line with that, where they've been saying like, look, all the core developers and main infrastructure people are relatively you know very pro small blocks, and then like you know a lot of these companies and miners are very like pro big blocks. But you know you 
they all they, they they actually flip the reasoning. Their their claim is that like you know the reason the core developers are overwhelmingly pro small blocks is because they have like some technical insight that makes them realize that big blocks are infeasible. Um, do you think that's a fair like you know how valid that claim is of, of theirs? I don't think that is the case. I think it's more of a difference of opinion on what's important and where the project should go. So for people in the Bitcoin Cash community, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash is like, you know, the, the most important thing. And you want to have the best property for the system, uh, you know, that fit that bill. Uh, people that were more in the small block size, they saw Bitcoin more as a settlement layer. And you would use other systems to transact like L2 and Lightning Network and maybe Liquid and, you know, various other stuff like that. And so you transact using those systems. And you use uh, uh, BTC just as a settlement layer for those systems. So there is a very important difference of vision. And so when you don't want to build the same stuff, then obviously the the trade off that you are making are not going to be the same. Uh, and and I, I think this is where the main difference is. But so why do you think there was a lack of, you know, big block support amongst uh, core developers? Like, why did the big blockers never really take, take, take step up and take like a big role in a lot of this core infrastructure development? Well, I think the people on the big block side, they were more um, uh, coming from the economic standpoint. And I came to Bitcoin from the economic standpoint. Um, and, and maybe that community was a bit weaker on the technical fundamental for quite some time, I think. I see, I see. They, I, I think a lot of people in the big block movement what he did not realize how important it was to make sure you have a solid infrastructure, but the people on the small box size, they realized that very much very early on. Yeah, that's very interesting. And then one of the things that is noteworthy is that most or majority of the core developers were in favor of small blocks, but at the same time, the miners tended to be in favor of bigger blocks. Why is that? I mean, why do you think there's any economic reasons why miners would prefer something like uh, electronic cash approach to, you know, this settlement vision? It always seemed a little bit counterintuitive to me because I, you'd think that miners would want higher transaction fees. So the smaller blocks. Well, no, like the revenue of the miner is the transaction fee times the number of transactions. Right, so for miner to generate higher revenue, you essentially have two two general direction they can go into. They can try to increase the volume of transaction, or they can try to increase the transaction fee. And I think that the increase the transaction fee approach actually don't make a lot of sense. The reason is that everything else being equal, you'd rather use the product that have smaller fee. So if there is one product that have very high transaction fee and limited capacity, and another one that have a very large capacity but low transaction fee, then on the long run, you should see most of the volumes, uh, you know, moving to the one that have high capacity and low fees. So I think if, if you are a, a miner and you are thinking about this long term, uh, the second, you know, the second one makes more sense, I think. Okay, so early on, there was a lot of these, you know, it's not fair to say that there was no uh, development support behind, uh, you know, big blocks. Um, rather, it just was missing from a lot of the, you know, Bitcoin core development team. But, you know, early on, we are, we we already started to see, um, you know, many alternative clients start to pop up. Things like, you know, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin uh, BU. So could you, uh, you know, tell us a little bit maybe about the history of these uh, alternative dev teams, alternative client implementations? So I, I was not involved very closely with all of them. So, I'm, um, you know, I cannot go to every detail because, you know, some of it I don't know. Uh, but essentially there was three big effort on the big block side. There was uh, XT, there was Classic, and there was BU. So I have a little internal knowledge about uh, what happened with XT. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think it, it got a fair amount of traction early on, but um, it was it was essentially disabled mostly by political move, if I understand the history correctly. So there was this uh, Hong Kong agreement, for instance, where uh, uh, car developers and miners agreed to not run XT 
and run car and in exchange car would eventually do a two megabyte increase, something like that. And so it's essentially like remove the win out of the, the sale of XT. Uh, but then later on, there was uh, Classic and BU and the two of them, you know, went pretty strong. I think they, they made a few mistakes and, and one of them is like not presenting a unified front. There was a lot of, um, you know, infighting between the two and they were not 100% uh, compatible in terms of the consensus rule that they implemented. It resulted in a fork in testnet. So then, you know, everybody gets cold feet uh, because it's not quite clear which one of the two you got to support and everything, right? So I think there was a, a bit of a strategic mistake. And on the other side, the other camp was also willing to play dirty. So when the other side is, is willing to play dirty, you really need to have your, your you know, <laughs> your act together. What do you mean with playing dirty? Can you expand on that? Yeah, so I, I mentioned already the thing that they were doing well, uh, like investing in infrastructure and stuff like that. But um, there was also so agreements like the Hong Kong agreement, for instance, that you know was more of a political move than anything else because they made some promise there that they had never, you know, they did not really intend to keep. Or, or maybe they changed their mind later and they intended to keep it at the time. It's not quite sure, but the whole stuff was, you know, very much political, much more than it was um, for for the benefit of the coin or for technical reasons. Um, there was also, a, yeah, there was also a fair like, you know, the the core developer that were more on the big block side. There were a few like uh, Mike Kern and Gavin Andreessen, but they found themselves isolated very quickly and and eventually removed from the project. Um, there was there was a fair bit of censorship going on on Reddit and, and and Bitcoin talk and a few places like that. So yeah, no, I just wanted to because you know we are speaking about uh, these things years ago, and probably many of our listeners are not uh, not not very up to date with that. So I just I wanted to spend like three minutes kind of recapping what happened. Back okay, then. yeah, sure. So basically, right, you had. You had on the one hand people who wanted to have bigger blocks, right? and we spoke a little bit about that and kind of division around that. And then a lot of the core developers they wanted to have this other thing called SegWit, which would give a lot of you know extra technical capabilities. And we can speak about that later too, exactly what SegWit was. And then you had these different factions, and there was a division and lots of uh, drama around it. And we did many episodes back then. You know, we had Mike Hearn on several times. We had Adam Back on and Greg Maxwell, and like so, had lots of discussions on this. But basically, you had these differing visions, and then there was this sort of agreement to do kind of both, right? So the core developer yes. says, okay, we'll do a two megabyte block size increase, at least we'll double it. Uh, and then the other one says, the miner said, okay, we'll go, uh, we'll go ahead with uh, SegWit and activate that. And uh, But the two megabyte thing came first. No, the SegWit thing came first, right? So the SegWit thing got... Activated. Yeah, so that was SegWit 2x. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think there were strategic mistakes made with SegWit 2x as well. Like you mentioned, the fact that the two don't activate at the same time was a bit of a mistake. I think there is also uh, probably a bigger mistake. And this was the mistake that led me to believe that SegWit 2x will fail with very high probability at the time. And so that, that BCH was very important. It was that. Um, at some point, the activation of SegWit2x was modified in no way so that it's compatible with the way UASF activates SegWit. So for people who don't know, UAS, uh, UASF is essentially a group of people that decided on August 1st, we're going to enable SegWit no matter what, and we're going to run a modified version of the Bitcoin Core software that does that. And you know, even if there is no majority support for the miner or whatever, we just are going to uh, activate SegWit and, and essentially fork the network with the SegWit branch on August 1. And that made a lot of people uh, very scared because a lot of people at the time were very scared of forks. And so they choose to activate SegWit2x in a way that was compatible with UASF. And I think that was a mistake because clearly the UASF people, they were not really there to find a compromise or have any kind of negotiation. They wanted to, you know, it was, it was a movement that was very much, you know, my way or the highway. And if you, if you, so 
Rather, if you don't modify the activation to be compatible with them, on August 1, they would fork themselves off the network. And they would find themselves on a minority chain. Um, and then, you know, like maybe they want it, maybe they don't want it, maybe they come back or whatever. But essentially, it removes a lot of wind out of their sail. On the other hand, if you activate SegWit in a way that is compatible uh, with what they wanted, then they stay on the chain, they can claim that SegWit uh, activated because of their effort. And so you give them uh, much more leverage in the negotiation suddenly. And you do that in between the time where they get what they want and when the other side is supposed to get what they want, right? So it's, it's pretty much a guarantee that you're going to have a bait and switch if you do it that way. Like if you empower the people in the negotiation, you give them more leverage that don't want the second part to happen. By the way, you do the first part, you're pretty much guaranteed that the second part is not going to happen. So that was what I saw at the time. So, you know, I've seen this like, debate happened countless endless times on Twitter already about like, you know, was that August 1st SegWit activation caused by UASF or by by the SegWit 2X agreement? And it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of impossible for anyone to really decide. It's kind of impossible. Like the way the way SegWit 2X was made essentially made it impossible to know. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS, and half that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. Before we continue talking about SegWit 2x uh, and like, you know, kind of the origins of Bitcoin Cash then, uh, one thing I wanted to bring it back for one second and is discuss really quickly, you know, we often like see that, you know, there's this like, you know, block size increase versus SegWit. And, you know, these are usually the two like main popular proposals that are well known. Yeah, but there's like other proposals, right? As well, like, you know, extension blocks, which is like, you know, how yes, you originally can I, got started. Can I, yeah. I want to go back to something that you guys said a few times um, when it was very much big block versus SegWit. And I think it's a, uh, it's a bit of a strange representation. It may be what it looks like no, but it was not like it was then. Um, if you go back in the past, there was this uh, proposal to do SegWit as a hard fork instead of doing it as a soft fork. And a lot of the people that would be no in the big block camp were actually in support of that. And, and uh, I was in support of that. I know people like Gavin Andreessen uh, were in support of that. So it's, it's not per se that everything is bad about SegWit. Uh, but the way SegWit was made as a soft fork creates an adversarial case of four megabytes for the, so when you implement SegWit, essentially you can create a block that is up to four megabytes, but effectively in terms of capacity, you get 1.4 to 1.7 X the capacity, depending on the assumption you make, we are probably going to see in, in a few months, you know, what is the real number, but in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. So less, less than, say less than 2x, but you get 4x adversarial case, which means your software need to be able to support up to 4x, you know, the base, uh, base block size. And that is not really a problem if you plan to keep the block small, right? But that's a very big problem if you want to increase the size of the block, because suddenly you have adversarial case that get incredibly big and someone can craft a special block that exploit that adversary case and bring the network to its knees. 
right? Like, yeah, I know like a lot of my issues with like the SegWit soft fork proposal is mostly just around technical debt where it just seemed to be a very complex change that touched like the all parts of every piece yeah, of code. So, yeah, that's, and- that's another, that's, a, that's another thing. The way, so the way it was done as a soft fork was uh, significantly more complex than the way as a hard fork. Because obviously you need to retrofit everything into the existing rules, but the existing rules has never been made uh, with the consideration that you would retrofit all of that in them. So uh, it was a bit more complicated, but that's the road they choose to to go into. So yeah, to to get back to your question, there was also a proposal like extension block. This was actually what I was working on initially. And so extension block was... um, Essentially, a way where uh, uh, you don't do anything special in the base block. The base block stays similar to what it always was before SegWit or before Big Block or anything. But you create this extension block in which you can uh, put SegWit like transaction in them. And this extension block would be 8 megabytes as per the proposal. And so you would create a situation where you get most of the benefit of SegWit. And you also don't get the main drawback of SegWit, that is the four megabyte adversarial case. And you get a bigger capacity as well. And this is a soft fork. So that seems to fit the um, requirement that you know many different parties wanted, or at least they said they wanted. So I started working on that. But then SegWit 2X started becoming big, so it kind of removed the winwood of the sale of the extension block ID. And at the same time, they were doing it in a way that I thought was likely to fail. So I I had to change plan. One of the things that was also interesting around the genesis of Bitcoin Cash is because the Bitcoin Cash started, uh, that was before, uh, you know, this was, so August 1st was this key date where UASF, the threat was there's going to be a Bitcoin fork in UASF and people still thought Segway 2x was going to happen. At least most people thought that. And Bitcoin Cash was actually launched beforehand, and people were not really paying attention to it. There was like, what's this weird thing, Bitcoin Cash? And then, uh, you know, when um, when Segway 2x started failing, that's really when Bitcoin Cash uh, picked up. So can you can you speak a little bit? Because when did you start uh, working on Bitcoin Cash? I mean. You you initiated this initial uh, fork as well, and yeah, I wrote most of the software and most of the spec for it. Uh, there was also this other guy that goes by the name of Free Trader that wrote maybe the the you know second biggest part of it. For you, it was very clear even at the time. Okay, Segway two X is going to fail. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is the right thing to do now. Maybe people don't see it this way, but soon they'll realize Segway 2x fails, and then you know there's going to start m- be momentum around Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, so maybe I would that put it as strongly because you get to realize at the time this is in the future. You never know 100 what's going to happen in the future. But I thought it was more likely than not that Segway 2x was would fail. So, but question about the timeline here. So you know, I, I I don't know if these dates are exactly right, but this is just what I was able to pull from like some articles and stuff. But it seems that uh, you know the Bitcoin Cash uh, uh, chain was announced on May 15th of 2017, but the Segwit 2X, like New York agreement, uh, didn't come out until May 23rd of 2017. So was the Bitcoin Cash, like, plan, like, happening with, did it, did, did, did these uh, initial seeds, are they, like, the result of se- the Segwit 2X, or is it a, like, you know, did you already have this idea going in even before the New York agreement? So there was an idea to effectively fork the chain and create a big blockchain, but I was, I was working on extension block at the time, as I mentioned. It was more of an effort that was supported by Classic and BU and XT as well. Uh, But when I I jumped in is that, so there was this segue to X stuff. I was convinced it it was unlikely to work. And at the same time, there was like a lot of discussion between Classic and XT and BU, but they seemed to not be able to agree on what the spec gonna look like. So roughly two months before yeah, two months, two months and a half before the actual fork date. This is when I jumped in. I see. And so, you know, so it was sort of this like, um, this like frustration, I guess, that like, you know, 
uh, you saw that this like Segwit two X thing wasn't going to work, and it just like you know you decided what 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 yeah, that was a lot of frustration on my side. Yeah, because yeah. what I was seeing at at the at the time is that on one side you have people that build something I'm not very interested in, but they are executing very well. Um, both on, on like the business side and, and the infrastructure side, the development and everything they are, you know, they are doing what it takes to make their thing work. Uh, except this was not the thing that I was interested in. And on the other side, there was a group of people that tried to do something that was more in line with what I wanted, but uh, they seemed to make mistake again and again. And, and so that was, um, yeah, that was, that was very frustrating. <laughs> And so how did this, uh, you know, coalition come together? So like you, so you mentioned like, you know, the XT classic and, uh, BU developers are kind of already, uh, you know, talking about this forum, but you know, the, the Bitcoin cash, like what I see as that coalition was bigger. Like, you know, you had a lot of these big miners like Bitmain, mm -hmm. you had like, you know, public figures, I'll call them like Roger Ver, like who, how did this like, you know, Thing just like in a short period of time of like like you mentioned two to two and a half months like really come together and coordinate to like it, it, it seemed when I, if I remember when from my memory like you know this Bitcoin Cash hard fork actually seemed very well coordinated there was like you know somewhat of a like unified messaging heat there how did like all that coordination come who like who's the one who really stepped up and organized this well it probably looked more organized than it actually was uh, from the outside from what you're saying. Um, <laughs> So who stepped up? So I, I stepped up for the spec and the code and, and did some coordination, uh, obviously, but uh, a lot of other people, actually, a lot of people that were in, in you know, the big block movement wanted to see that happen. And it was very organic. Um, there was no, you know, there was no mastermind being it. It was very organic. And so, so let's speak a little bit about, I mean, you touched on it before, right? That there was... A big disagreement was not so much, so much around SegWit, but seg around SegWit as a soft fork, and and there was, yeah, there was this strong argument in fear, which I honestly never fully understood that soft fork were such a uh, soft forks were such a dangerous thing, and of course other blockchains have taken a different approach. Bitcoin Cash has taken a different approach, Ethereum has taken a different approach, and kind of do regularly hard forks. But what what is what why is this such a big disagreement around that and what's what's the sort of your perspective and maybe a Bitcoin Cash approach to forks versus the Bitcoin one? So yeah, I think it's a bit like both positions are a bit strange to me. Uh, the like the no no hard fork ever whatsoever and and the one we need to do everything as a hard fork are you know like a bit weird kind of ideological positions, right? Um, I'd say, you know, it really depends on, it really depends on what you want to deploy in the network. Some, something just make more sense as a hard fork or soft fork. If you have, if you have a natural way, so say you want to add something new to the protocol. If you have a very natural, uh, you know, extension point where you can include that stuff, uh, then you should do it that way. And it's going to end up being a soft fork. But if there is no natural extension point, you should probably not try to retrofit something very weird in a place it doesn't quite fit and and just do a hard fork instead there is also um there is also this interesting idea that there is actually no difference between a soft fork and a 51 percent attack um it's just like a soft fork is just miner refusing to mine on on top of blocks that have some properties and and the 51 percent attack is the same right so the main difference is not a difference of what it is, it's a difference of uh, perception. If you like, if you like the new rules that the miner are enforcing, then it's a soft fork. It's uh, not a 51% attack. But if you don't like the new thing that the miner are enforcing, effectively, you are facing a 51% attack. So some people are a bit, you know, put off by this. Yeah, I remember that was one of the arguments that my current made. And I think we talked about it back then, where, where his argument was basically that uh, a soft fork is like more dangerous, right, for users because they don't explicitly, they don't kind of explicitly agree with this update, and they just kind of go along because that's the new rule. Whereas in the hard fork, 
okay, if you don't actually download the new client and run the new client, then you're not like kind of participating in this. So yeah, that's why it's, it's similar in the 51% attack in, in many ways, because as a user, you don't have a, you don't have a lot of say about what's going on in case of a soft fork. Right, you, like you know, yeah. a censorship of a like, you know, let's say we decide to censor a certain account, that that is a soft fork, really. Then, and so yeah, the, yeah, the, the main difference between is, a soft fork and a fifty-one percent attack is very much: uh, do you see the change as a good thing or a bad thing? That's that's the difference. It's the very much of a it's a perception difference. On the technical level, there is no difference. And so, what does the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem look like today? So what are the different teams and, uh, you know, the different clients? Okay. So in terms of not software, uh, Bitcoin ABC is, uh, still the main client. And this is the client that we wrote and continue to write, uh, BU is still very big within the, the BCH ecosystem. And I'd say one of, one of the client that is, uh, quite interesting is BCHT because those guys are. You know, so it's a bit more of an experimental client. Maybe I would not recommend the miner to use it to mine blocks or whatever, but um, uh, because they are more experimental, they can innovate much faster. So they are playing with a bunch of new ideas uh, faster than other clients are doing it. So it's uh, an interesting client to keep an eye on. And maybe, I don't know, what is it like specifically about no software or more generally about the different actors? Yeah, no, also more generally, like what, what else, or like what does the community look like today and how has it evolved since the, since the split? Oh, okay. Since the split in, in August or the one in No, no, November? I mean the original split for, away from, uh, from Bitcoin. Okay. Um, I think the community is actually stronger now, even though it's a bear market. So the situation look worse if you, uh, you know, if you look at it from the outside, but I think the community is much stronger. Um, it took, you know, at the big, at the beginning, like we mentioned, it, it was put together very quickly, actually. And, and so it took a bit of time for everything to settle down, to identify who are the good people doing solid work, who are the people that were just doing noise, uh, or making noise rather. And, and so it takes, it takes some time for everything to emerge and for people to take position that makes sense um, for them. And I think we are, um, we are in a better position on that front. We are more organized and, uh, and generally like everything is much higher level, let's say. So another question then actually as well that I had about like, you know, the planning of the fork was how did you guys come upon the name like Bitcoin Cash? Like why was this name chosen? And like, you know, obviously one of the most contentious things about this name is that like, you know, people like to say, oh, you're trying to like subvert the brand of Bitcoin. So how, how did this uh, come about? And, you know, the famous like Roger Ver catchphrase is like Bitcoin cash is Bitcoin. Like to what extent do you agree with that statement? And is that like what you're trying to do? Are you just, are you trying to replace Bitcoin? Or are you just trying to create some alternative that's like, you know, that that will coexist? What, what, what's the goal here? Okay, um, so yeah, we, we kept the name Bitcoin with it, Bitcoin Cash, because I think it has, it has a legitimate claim to the name Bitcoin, but in a bit of a different way than people who say Bitcoin Cash is the real Bitcoin or something like that. I don't think, I don't think the question of who is the real Bitcoin makes a lot of sense. I think it's, um, so, you know, if you say a Bitcoin Cash is the real Bitcoin, right? The, People within Bitcoin Cash are going to be happy with that statement, but the people within BTC are probably going to see that as a bit scammy. The people outside of crypto are like, you know, don't care about what's the real Bitcoin or, or what's not, right? It's not even on there. <laughs> it's not even a question they are interested in. So I think it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a red herring, right? People are putting way too much attention on that. So I'm happy to say, uh, that Bitcoin Cash is one Bitcoin, maybe, uh, and, and there are other flavors of Bitcoin. No, there is not like, you know, there is not just one Bitcoin like it used to be. And, and so then the name Cash is there, obviously, to, um, to say that, you know, this is, this is what we think is important about Bitcoin, right? This is the peer-to-peer -peer 
cash system aspect of it, like like in the title of the white paper. And, and uh, it's a bit of a statement that what we think is important is, um, is you know, like the intent building this peer-to-peer -peer cash system rather than adhering strictly to every single detail of what was coded and described in, in various early stuff. We recognize that, you know, maybe some of those stuff need to be improved, like the blog size need to be increased, for instance. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, um, yeah, it's a bit of a statement that this is, this is a kind of Bitcoin and this is what we think is important about Bitcoin. And so how do you, uh, personally feel about the nickname Bcash? Like, is that, you know, do you think it's a okay to use term? So th the problem I have with it is that it's used often in a pejorative manner. There wouldn't be so much people being like, oh, be cash, be cash. Um, then I probably wouldn't see a problem with it. It's probably a, um, a useful, you know, shorthand. But because it, because it now has acquired that negative connotation, then I don't like it too much. Now, today, you know, at one point, Bitcoin Cash was up to, you know, 20% of the Bitcoin, I think, market cap or maybe even higher. And, and you know, in terms of the hash rate, too, uh, the two chains were at some point almost at parity, I think, in terms of the hash rate. But like today, of course, Bitcoin is like much, much higher in the price. I think today Bitcoin's around, uh, you know, $4,000 when we record this and Bitcoin Cash, I don't know, in the 100 ish 130 so, and also that hash rate, there's, there's a big difference now, right? Bitcoin has a very high hash rate and, you know, as, as you would expect, right? Bitcoin cash. Yeah, hash rate on two price. So that's not very surprising on that front. Yeah, it's not very surprising, right? But of course, the, the whole security assumptions of proof of work and of Bitcoin are really that a 51% attack is, you know, expensive and that was what makes it secure. But so with Bitcoin cash today, but that's not really the case, right? Like a big Bitcoin miner on its own could maybe do, uh, you know, fifty-one percent attack on Bitcoin Cash. So, is that something that concerns you? Uh, yes and no. So, obviously, the the security on BCH is going to be smaller than on BTC because the the price is smaller. When you put it in dollar term, they are running an attack is still fairly expensive, and also miner have demonstrated in the past that they were willing to pull hash rate from BTC to put them on, on BCH temporarily, even at a loss to, to protect the chain. So it's, I think it's a, a very, very strong sign that, you know, the miner that are mining BCH uh, right now are totally fairly committed to protect it if, if the needs, uh, if the needs is there, right? But doesn't that putting a lot of dependence on like the altruism of certain miners or like, you know, the external incentives of certain mining pools? to protect the network because we've already seen like a number of like minority hash rate chains get 51% attacked in the last year and a half. Like, you know, the biggest example I think is probably Ethereum classic, which, you know, you know, I guess shares a lot of similarities in its positioning as Bitcoin cash where like, you know, it's positioned to it's like older brother, we'll say. Right. And yeah, so, so GPU coins tend to be weaker in that regard because with GPU, you can mine any other GPU coins, right? So the pool, the pool of available hash rate can be much bigger than what it looks like. It's not like people can just pull from ETH to attack ETC. They can actually pull from almost every coin on the market. Except but don't you think the pool ones. of uh, Bitcoin miners is even bigger than the pool of all GPU miners from all coins? Probably not. Like, except if you are ETH, that is, that is very big. But for most GPU coins, it's, it's much worse. I mean, I think your point is, is sort of fair that, okay, the miners have kind of proven that they will, to some extent, protect Bitcoin Cash and maybe step up. But that feels like, it feels like very weak. You know, it feels like in Bitcoin, you have, you know, you have these game theoretic assumptions and then you say, okay, it's actually economically infeasible to attack this at some, you know, at, at some scale. And then in this in this scenario, you say, okay, I mean, maybe that's kind of broken, but at least we kind of trust the entities that control this. So, I mean, it feels something essential was lost here. You always trust the miner 
though the trade-off that you're making here is a bit different it's actually fairly interesting and some so I, I don't agree with that I, I i kind of agree with you that it's weaker but actually some people agree that it's stronger and the argument goes as you are paying for that hash rate all the time if you're in the majority chain but actually having so much hash rate on the chain is only useful when you are under attack so in various ways you are overpaying for security Whereas if you have a pool of available hash that can, uh, you know, be used to defend in case there is an attack, then uh, it's more economically efficient. And and I would say actually both of those arguments are true in some way. So the security is weaker, but it's more efficient. Was um, merge mining ever a consideration? So because this is something I've talked about extensively with the Ethereum Classic dev team. Um, so, you know, what is this ever has this ever been open on the table, like potentially merge mining with Bitcoin? Well, the problem is so the problem here is that if you ever get close to the size of, of the chain you are matching from, then you are in the world of trouble uh, because the incentives don't work anymore. And I think. I think this is likely to happen, so. We talked about oh, BCH ended up being like a non-negligible portion of BTC before. In those condition, merge mining would not have worked very well. It would have been a big problem. And actually, I kind of predicted that the, the share of BCH compared to BTC would decrease a bit uh, during the bear market. And the reason is um, the reason is that people are more sensible to the problem that causes immediate pain rather than possible problem that's going to happen in the future, right? And so right now, Bitcoin is not running at capacity. So Bitcoin is working like fairly well if you want to transact. It's maybe not as cheap as BCH, but it's fairly cheap right now. Uh, but what's going to happen is that when you, when, like, you know, during the next bull run, when uh, people are going to come in, uh, you're going to see the same problem that we saw last year on BTC. And and I expect that this, um, I expect when that happened that the, the share of BCH compared to BDC to increase again. And so that, that would be a mistake to do merge mining in those conditions. And do you, do you think it will ever make sense to explore like really very different approaches to securing uh, Bitcoin Cash, whether, I don't know, that's proof of stake or something else? Um, so... We have in the pipeline that technology called Avalanche. Maybe we want to talk about it later. Um, but Avalanche, essentially, uh, this is something we want to use to improve zero conf. But one of the one of the side effects you get out of it is that it's much more difficult to do a fifty one percent attack on, on the coin. And so uh, that is that is the kind of stuff that is in the pipeline as well. And I think it's probably a better approach than the nerf mining one. If you buy this narrative that like, you know, the majority of the miner, so a miners on Bitcoin were like, you know, big blockers, couldn't you do, was it ever in the books or like thought process of, you know, soft forking a block size increase into Bitcoin? And so obviously by that, I, you know, I mean things like extension blocks or like, you know, you, you, you merge mine Bitcoin cash and, and, and soft fork a drive chain between them and like, you know, force them to be act in parity and stuff. Like were any of these kind of things ever in the consideration of like forcing big blocks upon Bitcoin through a soft fork? Um. Yeah, well, obviously I worked on extension blocks, so that was kind of uh, one of the ideas behind extension blocks. Um, though, I don't know, I don't like this idea of forcing onto people, uh, whatever. Um, if, if there is a disagreement on something, I think it's better to fork and... Um, so, okay, it's not better, it's better to find an agreement. Right, but if no agreement can be found, it's I think better to fork and see what the market value at the end. When when this kind of stuff happened, you actually saw both branch of the fork increase in value. So the, the case of, of BTC and BCH, or the case of uh, ETH and ETC, in both cases the sum of the two coin is larger than the sum of what was before. And the reason is you have two vision, right? And none of the vision can realize itself while everybody is fighting with each other. And after that, you have two vision that can be realized. So the, the, 
the overall value is increased. Obviously, if you fall for uh, a more frivolous reason, then uh, this doesn't happen, right? You see a, a net destruction of value, but but if the situation is really such as you have two vision and the people that have those two vision are fighting with each other and they cannot come with an agreement, then you are better off working than forcing, you know, half of the community to something they don't want. Now, can we like talk, shift gears and talk a little bit more about like, you know, Bitcoin Cash's uh, approach to scalability? And so, you know, you had this great uh, blog post uh, talking about like, you know, how you re you guys are really focused heavily on like client uh, imp uh, like improvements and how we can create clients that can like start to support bigger blocks and so yeah can you go ahead and just give us a bit of a summary of that you know vision there okay yes so um, on the high level there are many arguments that were made by the people that are more on the small block size that. Uh, there are problems when you increase the size of the block. And those arguments tend to be right on the qualitative aspect, but not very right on the quantitative aspect, right? So you don't run into all those problems when you increase immediately to a few megabytes and, and you know instead of one megabyte. But if you want to go to very large block, then there is there is there, there are actually many problems that uh, that you run into. And Basically, they boil down to that assumption. So for a blockchain that is based on proof of work to work well and all the incentive to work properly, you need that the time required to propagate a block on the network and validate it, you need that time to be small compared to the block time. Because when that's not the case, um, you first start to have perverse incentive in the mining that start to occur. And after that, the next step is that it doesn't work anymore, right? So if the if the time you need to propagate the block and validate it is more than 10 minutes on a Bitcoin or you know any variation of Bitcoin that have a 10 minute block time, then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna find block faster than block can propagate on the network. So suddenly the situation um, is that the network doesn't converge to one, you know, one truth anymore. It's just like forks more and more and more and more faster than it can converge. And, and so if you want to have bigger blocks, you cannot just say, okay, we changed that number in the software and everything is going to work great. You actually need to have solution for those various problems that makes the propagation and the validation of a block slower. And so on the very high level, it, it's not like it's more of a death by a thousand cut kind of problem, then there is like this big issue you want to solve. But generally, you want first, if you want to make the propagation faster, you need to propagate less information, right? That means that uh, you, need, you need the node to be able to predict what the next block is going to look like as much as possible. And so then you need only to transmit the difference between what the node expect and and what the reality is. And, and you want to keep that difference as small as possible. So that's the that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that you want to be able to validate the block very quickly. And to do that, you need to be able to validate the block in such a way that you have many small independent chunk of work to do that don't depend on each other. And that way you can have you know different core of a machine to do each of them, or even if we scale very big, you can have a rack of machine and each of them do a, a portion of the work. But if you have, if you have work that depend on each other, like what we call serial, then um, it's a bit of a challenge. So, so the general idea is like limit the serial stuff and deploy technology that allow not to synchronize with each other as much as possible ahead of time, so that they have you know less work to do when the block arrives. Right. Uh, just last week, we actually had uh, Alexei Yakunov uh, from TurboGeth, and he's like kind of approaching a lot of these very, very similar approach to the scalability issues in uh, Ethereum, where like, you know, a lot of other people are focusing on like sharding and stuff. But Alexei, he's been really focusing on like, you know, let's push down the propagation time. Let's like improve this, improve the sync speed. Let's improve the validation speed. So you know, a lot of similarities there. Well, those are not, you know, those are not very new ID. Um, this is all many large scale systems. This is all Facebook works, for instance. Uh, 
where the work is done in such a way like there would be no way to do any kind of serial work at Facebook scale, right? It's just impossible. Um, so the, all the work is organized in such a way that you can distribute on many machines a small amount of work and this small amount of work don't depend on the work that the other machines are doing, right? And, and then all the machine propagate a result back to you and you can aggregate those results and deduce whatever you want to compute from it. I would say let's go into, so you mentioned a little bit that the performance increase comes when, you know, propagation happens more quickly and propagation can happen more quickly if, you know, I as a node can already uh, kind of like tell what the next block is going to look like without having, you know, whole blocks being sent around. Uh, I guess that ties into the topic of transaction ordering uh, and then the changes you guys have made there. I mean, but first of all, let's, like, how does transaction ordering work today in Bitcoin? And what were the downsides of this? Okay, so right now in Bitcoin, the transaction ordering is such as, uh, we call it topological in, in computer science term. And what that means is that you can essentially put transaction in any order in there with the only constraint that if one transaction spent from another, uh, they need to be order such as the, you know, the parent transaction is first and then the one that's spent from the parent, uh, the check transaction is after in the block. So you have, you have this constraint, but you have no other constraint in, in the block. Okay. And, and so that means that if I'm as a miner, I create a new block and, you know, Sunny is a different miner, then Sunny has basically like no, I mean, he may be able to sort of predict what transactions will be in that block, but uh, he doesn't know kind of the structure of the block. Yes, exactly. Um, because, because there are many possible valid ordering, uh, then when you find a block, you not only need to transmit to the other party what transactions are in the block, but you also need to transmit the, the order in the block. And when you do the, the computation based on information theory, Let's say, assume you know of a set of transactions and Sony knows also of a set of transactions that is almost the same as you, right? Because you're both connected to the same network and the transaction propagate on the network. So you both know of about the same transaction. So let's assume that you want, you find a block and you want to tell Sony what this block is looking, you know, what, what the block looks like. Well, if you know of the same transaction, you just need to send him one bit, yes or no, for each transaction, right? So if there is n transaction flying around, theoretically, you could transmit n bit of information to Sunny to tell him what transaction is in the block and what transaction is not in the block. Obviously, in practice, you need to send more than that, but that's the you know, theoretical limit. Now, if the ordering is important, then you need to send also the information about in what order they are. And obviously, if you have n transaction, then the first transaction can be in n different position, right? And the second one in n minus one position, because it cannot be where the first one is, and so on. So you get n factorial possible ordering. And, and to transmit that, you need n log n bits of information. So you have a factor log n here um, of difference between the two. So say if you have, if you have a thousand transaction in your block, then you literally have 10 times more information that is about ordering than transaction that is about what is in the block and what is not. And as you grow bigger, it only gets worse. So any kind of technology that rely on you and Sony, you know, having a common knowledge of what the state of the work is, uh, end up essentially transmitting almost only uh, information about ordering and very little information about what's actually in the block. And so those are the theoretical limit, but in practice, you have this technology called graphene that allows to transmit block. And there are two versions of graphene that have been implemented. Um, right now, they are in the prototype stage. And one that transmits the other and one that doesn't. And you see that the one that uh, doesn't transmit the other needs seven times less information to, to propagate the block. So it's a not as good as the 10x you would expect from the theoretical perspective, but we can see that it's this in the same ballpark. Okay, that's amazing. 
And I, I mean, I know in Bitcoin, there's also been, you know, some kind of efforts on, you know, reducing propagation time. There's a, a relay network, but the, that works differently because that only transmits the headers or like, is there, what are the similarities and differences with the efforts that have happened on the Bitcoin side to reduce propagation time? So, so the general idea is the same, right? The general idea of all the fast relay techniques being like compact block or the fast relay network or, or graphene or whatever, right? They all rely on the same assumption that if you want to send a block to Sunny, the two of you have a lot of information in common already. You know about um, most of the transactions that possibly can be included in the block. And so instead of transmitting the content of the block to Sunny, you transmit it a special you, you transmit to him a special data structure that's going to say usually there is a, a short id that is associated with each transaction and you're going to say to sunny the block of this 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 and that transaction by sending a list of short ids and then sunny is going to look into the transaction he knows about and match the short id to know which one are in the block and you need to have those short ID that are ordered uh, in the way they appear in the block. And uh, that's almost, um, you know, mass fast block relay. You know, they, they all do some kind of variation of this. And, and I guess in Bitcoin, the thing is that what you guys or what you guys are, are trying to do here with having a kind of a, a predefined order, right, where it's exactly like if I produce a block with a certain number, a certain list of transactions in it, that block is going to look the same as if Sunny produced a block with the same transactions. Is yeah, that so, basically? Yeah. Yeah. So so let's imagine we um, we continue on the the same technique, right? So you send to Sunny a list of short ID that correspond to each transaction. Then for the first one, Sunny need to match all the transaction it knows about to know if it matched that short ID. And for the second one, the same, and the short one, the same, and so on, right? But if you have a predefined ordering, Sunny is only gonna need to match the transaction that could possibly fit at that position in the block, right? So if there are 10 transactions in the block, then for each ID, uh, Sunny needs to uh, essentially uh, have like one tenth of the amount of transaction to match that short ID which means you can get much more aggressive on how small the short IDs are because they need to discriminate between much less transactions. That's the, that's the intuition behind why you can transmit much less information. But, but the change that, that, so you said that's in, in tests now and in exploration is this graphene, but when this graphene would come to Bitcoin Cash, you would basically have a, you know, canon, like a, a predefined transaction ordering and if I have, I produce a block certain amount of transactions, it will look the same as with Sunny. And so then we can, we can cut down the amount of data that's being propagated. Yes. That's the and idea, this would, yes. And this would, of course, be a hard fork as well. Uh, no, no. The hard fork is enforcing transaction ordering, which we do. So now we can deploy graphene, uh, you know, whenever, whenever it's ready. Right now it's in prototype stage, but, you know... Um, probably going to be ready during the year. So, so now you do have a transaction ordering which is enforced already, but there isn't the technology to kind of take advantage of that order to like reduce the amount of data that's being sent around. And that's the graphene thing. Exactly, exactly. That technology is in prototype stage at this point. It's not yet deployed. But so really quick though, this does come at a cost though, right? Because so once you've gotten rid of this, uh, the so what was the term you used? The uh, natural transaction ordering or whatever the the topological whatever, topological uh, transaction ordering. Once you get rid of that, now you have now you put uh, extra burden on any full node or anyone who's verifying a block to basically make sure that you don't have like. You, you know, you don't have, how do you deal with like this child pays for parent and whatnot? Uh, oh, okay. So, um, from the client's perspective, uh, the person that received the block and needs to validate it, what actually happens is that topological ordering is exceedingly difficult to validate in parallel. And this is one of the reasons we wanted to remove it because you can, uh, you can parallelize the block validation, uh, you know, it's easier to parallelize the block validation. 
And the way you do it is that you pass over the block twice. So once you pass over the block and go over all the outputs of all the transactions and you add them all to the UTXO set. So that part can be done in parallel. Um, it's like very embarrassingly parallel. And then you do a second pass on the block and you go over all the input and you mark all the input uh, that have been spent in the block as spent. And if you do it that way, you essentially have a two-step process to validate the block, and each one of these steps is, um, you know, very parallelizable. Yeah, but I don't see how this helps with the parallelizability here. It seems like you could do something similar with topological. I don't see why top in the optimistic case and topological, you could be doing it in parallel, and only when you hit like. A, par a child pays for parent, then you have to deal with that, right? Yeah, so, uh, um, yes. Yes, absolutely. You can do it optimistically in parallel and then fall back to, uh, to the topological stuff. Uh, but, but your fallback is going to be serial, right? Always. So I can produce a block with a lot of chain transaction in them and get you to validate it in like, you know, you have no essential, you have no parallelism out of that. So I can poison you with, with a bad block. But isn't that true in this as well? Can't I just create a block of like a chain of child pays for parents and just like, and then you basically essentially end up falling back to sequential as well because you're gonna have to do iterations like no, so because, many times. No, because um, you are gonna add all the output to the UTXO set, right? So say you have a thousand chain transaction and they all have one input, one output to make, you know, to make it simpler to understand. Then you're gonna add the 100, output to the UTXO set, and then second pass, you're going to spend uh, 100 output. And so at the end, you're going to have like, you know, one that is spent and, and one, one that is created in the UTXO set. Great. No, that's, that's, that's very helpful. And that, that sounds like a, a very interesting change. Now, another, another thing that's interesting, so Bitcoin Cash, when you guys forked uh, the new block size in Bitcoin Cash is 8 megabytes. Uh, and in the, since then, there's been a further block size increase to 32 megabytes. Like, why is that? I mean, the Bitcoin Cash today, there's not that much usage. The blocks are mostly empty. It was never really at capacity. So what was the reason to go to 32? I'd say probably because we can. <laughs> um, yeah, you got to understand that because, because there was so much contention to increase the block size to begin with, uh, there is a bit of a apprehension within the BCH community that the block size is, is going to be stuck. And so, uh, so I think this is mostly why, even though it's not, it's not needed right now, we, we would have eight meg right now. We would be perfectly fine. Like we, we are not, you know, we are not using that much capacity, but people are afraid that by the time we need that much capacity, then maybe, you know, the ecosystem would have grown a lot and we would have like another class of, of small blocker in there, maybe. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So basically you're saying you want to default, uh, to change the default now when, you know, there's no real controversy around it rather than get into a situation again, like in Bitcoin. And of course, in Bitcoin too, uh, I mean, I know initially when Bitcoin was launched, I think there was... I don't know block limit or it was like a really big one. And then at some point it was added as a sort of hack. Oh, let's just put this in for the moment so that like somebody can create a giant block. And then later when we reach it, we get rid of it. I think that was the thinking of Satoshi back then. And uh, it didn't seem like he you know, anticipated that this was going to become a contentious issue. Yeah, I think this is what happened. Yeah. So, so because that happened once, you know, people are kind of afraid that it's going to happen twice. So right now there is a discussion within the BCH community to have an algorithm set the block size rather than, uh, than having people deciding once in a while to increase it. Yeah, that was the original uh, idea behind like the original Bitcoin Unlimited proposal, right? Uh, no, Bitcoin Unlimited is a, a bit of a different proposal. What they were doing is... Uh, what they call emergent processes. So essentially it, it creates the notion of a soft consensus rules, right? So if you have a block that is very big and that is bigger than your block size, instead of marking that block invalid, you would mark it excessive, right? And 
which means it's not invalid, but you are not going to follow that chain right now. And then what happens is that if you see that most of the network is building on top of that other block that you consider excessive, rather than on top of what you consider is you know, the main chain, then you are going to reconsider that block and try to actually validate it. So that is, that is the idea behind emergent consensus. One of the problems with that is that it creates uh, create a situation where it's quite difficult to upgrade, actually, because everybody needs to do it at the same time. Because if you, if you do it by yourself, you, you know, may end up creating blocks that are too big that everybody rejects and you lose a bunch of money. So it puts miner in a bit of a tough spot. So I think this is why, um, why it wasn't widely adopted. I see. I also heard like some stuff about like the Bitcoin Unlimited team uh, working on what they call gigabyte blocks. Uh, is that like, you know, how realistic of a proposal is this? And like, is this like some sort of like, you know, long term vision thing? Or is this like something that you guys are looking into in like the very near future? So the Bitcoin Unlimited people are running what they call the Gigablock testnet. Um, that is, uh, you know, that is what the name say. That's a testnet with like ridiculously large block size and they have tool to generate a ton of transaction on there. And the main goal is not to do like gigabyte block right now, but it's to identify what kind of bottlenecks exist and what kind of challenge uh, exists when you want to, to grow the capacity of the network. And then we can have, um, you know, we can take lesson and have data that come from that experiment and use that to, to improve the software today. Um, but there is no immediate plan to move to one gigabyte. Though, you mean like if, if the software can support it and if it works and everything, why not? Right. But it's not, it's not the case right now that we can do that very safely. Okay, cool. And then, so, you know, I, I guess the last thing, uh, you know, as we're running up on time for this week, uh, one of the last things I want to ask about, like, you know, one of the reasons that I actually personally got like, you know, pretty um, interested in Bitcoin Cash was uh, you guys seem to have a, like, you know, we, we've discussed this throughout, uh, but you guys seem to have a very open policy on hard forks. And so, you know, to me, Bitcoin Cash just seemed as this place where like, okay, all of these like ideas that could be done as hard forks on Bitcoin, now we actually have a place to like try them out and test them. And so I know that you guys came up with like some roadmap pr process where like you uh, are committing to like six hard forks every six months or something similar to that. Uh, could you go ahead and discuss a little bit about, you know, how this was agreed upon and like why it was agreed upon? Yeah, so there was, uh, yeah, this is what we do. We do uh, um, uh, an upgrade that usually bundle a few hard fork and a few soft fork change every six months. And we are not the first to do that. Actually, Monero have been doing that for a fairly long time. And, and you have other coins that don't have a very specific schedule, but uh, that also do hard fork on a regular basis, like ETH. So the, the, reason, the reason why we went that way is um, because we knew that if we want to increase the capacity a lot, we're going to need to change a few stuff. It's not enough to just change a number and expect everything to work well, right? Um, because the number is more of a security measure because there are stuff that don't work when you go bigger. And it's not because you change that number that suddenly it becomes secure to, uh, you know, do, do big blocks. And so we, we knew that we would need to improve all that thing works to be able to create and propagate and validate those large blocks faster if we wanted to, uh, you know, realize that vision essentially. So, so we needed to have some way to do hard fork to do that. And, um, doing it on a schedule that is set ahead of time makes things easier for everybody because now everybody knows what to expect. Well, then, uh, thanks so much, Armory. This was a really, uh, really great discussion. And so I think that concludes our, our first part. Uh, of this Bitcoin, big Bitcoin Cash uh, episode or interview. And so we're going we're gonna to do a second part, which comes out next week. And we're going to speak about, you know, bit the, the split, you know, there was a fork of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. And then, of course, there was the fork between Bitcoin Cash and now what became Bitcoin SV. So we'll speak about that. And then we'll also speak about 
Uh, you know, a lot of other things that you guys are working on technically, because Bitcoin Cash is cer certainly like experimental in exploring a lot of interesting new technology. So yeah, we'll come back to that uh, interview next week. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.